Ready? All right. Yeah, we're getting started. Cool. Thanks, Jamal. All right. Uh, so we're getting near the end of the uh, OVS and TC track, it seems like. Um, so thanks, everyone, for staying around for a few minutes. Uh, so I'm Andy Gospodarek. This is Don Walwork. Uh, we're from Broadcom. We're going to talk about our catchy title of the core cost of doing business. Uh, Try to characterize uh, what it takes to use OBS and maybe deploy OBS and look at um, kind of a typical use case. Um, we know that a lot of people have religion around OBS and uh, some love it, some don't. People from both groups are probably in this room. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it's, it's re extremely popular. Uh, we have a lot of discussions with customers about it all the time. So we thought we'd sort of take a look at it. So uh, typical. You might think of a typical server. I don't know why I keep looking there. I can look here. Anyway, uh, if this were, say, a 24-core system, uh, if I'm doing my math right, six times four, there we go. Uh, we've got maybe six of those, or half of those cores are available for actually running virtualized applications, whether it be containers, VMs, whatever. And let's say because you're running open vSwitch, you decide that you need to allocate four cores for doing network, hence the ends. Uh, you might also have some storage backing that needs to be done, for either those for the host or for the the applications, uh, those are the S's. Uh, we picked good letters for these, we feel like. Uh, H would be the hypervisor management um, or the host management. And um, uh, actually, H would be the hypervisor, M would be the management networking because you don't need much of that. We're, we're really focused on data plane. So the question is, you know, can you migrate some of these off? What if you had a bunch of cores that were available or what if you had fancy hardware offload? What could you do? All right, so this next slide kind of goes through the, uh, the test setup that we used to, uh, to do all of our characterization. So we had a dual socket Intel system. Uh, in, in this case, there were 32 cores. We're using a Broadcom 2x25 gig NIC. And uh, what we did was we sent the traffic in on, one, in on both ports, and then we're measuring the system load um, under different profiles. So we're running uh, Red Hat Linux 7.6, uh, and this is, as much as possible, this is just straight out of the box. So it's the, uh, the kernel version that ships with uh, 7.6 and the, uh, the inbox open vSwitch. Uh, we did, of course, do uh, Affinity to pin the, the uh, OBS uh, processes, or the, uh, really the rings, to the same NUMA node. Um, so that we don't get uh, inter NUMA uh, performance penalties. Um, and we're just doing simple layer three forwarding. There's no NAT and no, uh, no filtering, anything like that. Just pretty, uh, pretty straightforward setup. So what we wanted to characterize in this first set of tests that we ran was to understand the per core performance that we get, uh, and in this case, is th this is using uh, iMix, packet, iMix average packet size, and we wanted to see, um, A, how much performance do we get on a single core, and does that performance scale linearly as we increase the number of cores? And what we did, what we saw was that this did scale very linearly as we increase the number of cores. We're getting... Uh, about 1.3 million packets per second with a single core, and uh, that number was very consistent, up to four cores. Um, in this test setup, you begin to see the performance degrades a little bit um, because in the setup that I'm using, now I've got, uh, I'm using all 16 cores on this one NUMA node, so I've got one of those that's sharing with the rest of the system processes and interrupts and, and things like that. So there's a little bit of degradation once I scaled out to eight cores, um, but overall pretty consistent scaling. Um, the thing that's uh, you know not great is that we see that the performance is like 1,900 cycles per packet, uh, which is pretty expensive. But we're just trying to establish a baseline. This is what we saw. Uh, when we're, we're forwarding. And this is with the kernel data path. Right. You, you this that. is the, the kernel data path. We did not, it, these tests did, were not doing any kind of hardware offloads. This is a simple bridging? No VXLAN or nothing? This oh, is the layer, layer three, three forwarding. forwarding. So we're, yeah. 
coming in, we're using a traffic generator coming in on one port, going out on the other port. Just very simple test. Um, yes. Can you yeah, the good question. question. The, uh, the question is about hyperthreading. Hyperthreading was disabled in the setup, so we didn't did not do any kind of hyperthreading uh, uh, for these tests. Uh, so, yeah, number of flows. Uh, the number of flows in this case was uh, this is a single flow. Um, okay. We did other tests. I mean, I, a flow per core. Right, right, right. I, I, actually, let me take that back. It was not a single flow because that would not scale with RSS. Uh, we had multiple flows. We we're generating different L3 streams so that we're distributing the traffic using RSS. So really the way that we're controlling the number of cores in these tests is by uh, setting the number of rings on the NIC and then setting the affinity for those rings uh, for given cores, and then the traffic is distributed with RSS to different cores. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this next test, we wanted to see how does the performance change as we increase the packet size. So we went from the uh, IMX size of 358, and then a few different steps up to uh, MTU size. And again, we're seeing pretty consistent performance uh, in this range. So. Um, we felt like this was a pretty good baseline uh, for our additional tests. All right, uh, so now, now we get to the fun, right? Are you doing this one? You can do this one. No, Go I'll ahead. do it. Go sure. Yeah. All right. So the next test, we wanted to see what happens because you have different performance characteristics when you hit a flow that's already programmed in the data path versus a new flow that arrives. And so. What we did was we uh, offered new, new traffic uh, with short duration streams so that over time you end up with an average number of, of uh, a consistent average number of flows in the system. But the key thing that we wanted to characterize here is uh, what kind of forwarding rate can you get when you hit in the data path versus when you miss and you, you have to do an up call to user space to add the flow and then push the packet, uh, re-inject the packet into the data path uh, via the miss path. And so pretty dramatic difference here. There's a, a 13 times uh, more expensive to do that miss processing than to do the hit. Um, so that's pretty dramatic impact that we saw. Um, so the next step was really, this is, a this is a projection of from the maximum rate per core that you can achieve down to the, uh, if you had 100% miss rate, what kind of performance would you get? And this shows the dramatic drop off that you get when you're, you're doing more, as the number of misses as a percent of your traffic increases. So kind of wanted to understand that as you have more and more churn in your flows, what is the impact on your overall system behavior? All right, so we thought, you know, that one of the, the cure-alls for, for these problems, the, the panacea for this is, what about hardware acceleration? What can we do if the data path is actually offloaded to uh, hardware? And so in that, in that situation, uh, our maximum hardware rate would be 90 million packets per second in this particular uh, device. Um, and if we have eight cores dedicated to processing the misses, what does that look like? And surprise, surprise, it's still pretty bad. Um, so there's, it doesn't matter how great your hardware offload is. Uh, if you start missing, the cost is basically the same as if you're missing from the kernel data path. So again, new traffic that's being set up, um, I mean, you can, you can see right here, it just takes a huge, huge hit. And what really is the most important part about all this is that your, your hit rate is what is going to dominate your throughput, so. Um. Yeah, the other thing I want to point out is in order to see a difference between, uh, so what we have on this chart is really two different lines. One is if you had one, a single core using today's, uh, today's control plane to add those flows uh, when you have a miss versus a theoretical 10x improvement 
in that control plane processing and distributing that to eight cores. So really, in the control, in the control plane in this graph, that's the, uh, the orange line shows really an ADX improvement in that uh, control plane, and yet it barely moves that line. So that's a pretty important point that uh, your performance drops off and, um, I mean, if you were doing all misses, then all you can do is what the control plane can do. That's so. right. So it's, this, was, this line was a little bit shocking to us when we first were start, started thinking about it. Like, well, what if we really, what if we just made it a goal? Oh, we'll make sure that user space lookups are faster or all that process is cleaned up. You know, what, what would happen? And it basically didn't move, didn't move the line at all. So, uh, all right. Okay, so this next slide is, uh, it takes a look at, well, if we run this on DPDK, how does that compare? So in this case, <laughs> Uh, you know, a DPDK, it's, it's basically the same kind of profile. Uh, DPDK, we measured at about 25, little, almost 26 million packets per second when you're uh, hitting in the data path, but you have the same cost there. I mean, a control plane miss is expensive, is a, the bottom line. Um, you're a little bit better in, in DPDK because you don't have to, uh, you're not making transitions between user space and, uh, and the kernel path to add the flows, but not much. I mean, at this scale, you end up essentially at the same place. So that's, that's kind of what that one showed. So we started thinking about this in the context of Amdell's Law. So for those that uh, may or may not have heard of this, I'll bore you with a brief explanation of it. Um, so it's a way to calculate, it's an old rule, uh, it's an old sort of law that's been created, and it's a way to calculate the theoretical speed up that you get from improving a part of a task. So um, you can see these, these particular things here. The, the idea here is that the speed up of the task is improved with lowercase s, and p is a proportion of that, of that execution time that's improved. So this is a way for us to sort of quantify our, our 10x improvement, if you will, of of that, how much is that really gonna make a difference overall? So if we apply this uh, 10X speed up, and if we decided that um, in this particular case, um, an 85% hit rate would mean that we spend 75% of our time processing misses and other time processing misses, uh, or hits and misses. Um, you do the math, uh, which hopefully is fairly readable. Uh, oh, it is. Um, uh, only results in like a three times speed up. So. Again, this misprocessing really just to prove the point that it is so expensive to do this uh, that, that that's, that's not, not amazing. So here's kind of where the conclusion that we sort of get to. Um, so if we have this compute server where we previously talk about four cores that we're burning uh, for OBS, that not allowed to actually use to run applications or use to rent out to whoever is gonna rent VMs from us, um, not sure who would rent VMs for me, but anyway, um, OBS in this case consumes four cores. So we, of course, uh, like many people, have a smart NIC that's got the capability to move load down there. So you could save those four cores by moving them down to Stingray. Uh, in this case, we actually have eight cores, so we could just go ahead and burn all those cores for this. Um, and this frees up the cores. So. The other, the other kind of key piece to think about uh, that's also possible in this scenario is not only could we, again, move the four cores down there, if we really wanted to, we could also then hardware offload those. Uh, we've sort of shown that the hardware offload case may or may not be super helpful if you're processing a lot of missed packets. If you're processing a lot of packets that uh, are previously learned, you're in good shape. But this is sort of the this is the, the holy grail, the utopia that everybody wants is, you know, we're not doing, magically not doing any work in the CPUs anymore. We've offloaded everything to hardware. Um, so this is the, sort of the, the, the premise here that, we, that we'd like to do. Right, so the, the, uh, the thing that really I wanted to bring out here as Andy was just describing is if we take, uh, take a look at this load and different ways that you could run OVS on your server. So this, this chart shows four different profiles. One is you're running the kernel data path on four cores that are dedicated for that server. In that case, you're getting 5.4 million packets per second. Uh, let's say you decided to change that load or, or change the distribution and 
I want to run DPDK on that. That gets you, uh, you're, you're consuming those four cores doing the DPD, OBS DPDK data path. That gets you to almost to 26 million packets per second. Um, as Andy was saying, you could take that load, run it on a Stingray, dedicate all eight cores to that, uh, and do the OBS DPDK data path on the Stingray, and now that takes you to 28 million packets per second. And then finally, if you're running, it, again, and the key thing is uh, zero, zero server cores, so now those cores are freed up to run uh, your, uh, your customer applications. Um, so uh, in both of the two green lines on the right, you're, using, you're consuming zero server cores for the networking load, and uh, now you've got, uh, and finally, 90 million packets per second is using the true flow offload on the Stingray. So you've got hardware offloaded data path, um, and you're, you're fully, fully taking advantage of the capabilities of the SmartNIC. So I see Tom has a okay. question. So I'm a little confused because we just spent a lot of time saying the control path was the bottleneck. And this is saying we're offloading the data path. Is this, does this include the misses on, in OVS? This is really showing the hit case. So this okay, is Okay, are, are you going to get to the, the miss case? Because it sounded like the miss case was the problem, right? The and miss case is a problem, and it's the same problem wherever you run it. It's, it's going to be... That's a cost of doing business that you can't fix based on where you place the control plane, unless you dramatically uh, uh, improve that control Okay, so plane. let me just, one, one comment. So are we done talking about the control plane then? Well, Actually, uh, well, can are, I? Are you? <laughs> no, no, can, uh, just Well, I'm, I'm interested in it, the way you described it. No, so. So, so Tom, can I re-ask you a question as go back to the chart, your last slide. What's we, the difference between, okay, somebody get the chart up there. Can we put the, yeah, so yeah, there we go. What's the difference between the third and the fourth column? I don't understand the difference. The third, the third column is running the OVS DPDK, DPDK data plane on the, uh, the smart NIC. What does that mean? What does so it the, mean to so, run the DPDK? So on the server, if yeah. you run OVS DPDK, then DPDK implements your, uh, your forwarding plane. Correct, it's called right? that's forwarding. You can packets. do the same thing on the ARM cores on oh. the uh, on the smart net. Okay, so okay, fine. That, that's a why, but okay, you're just getting off the cores. That's that's, that's the only that's reason. That's the why. We're getting off the cores. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Let, let me ask the obvious question then. Sure. Can I run the control plane on the ARM on the NIC? Yes, yes you can. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Do you have the projections for that? Um, not in this deck. Um, we, but how, what does that solve though? I mean, you're still going to have those, mi if you have misses, does that help just because you're running it on the NIC? Yeah, because the misses don't hit the whole point of this. So, right. and maybe we didn't do a good job making that right. clear. So the point of this is that all of your OVS work is off the Xeon cores in this case, or your ARM server cores, whichever flavor of server core you like to use. So right. we're not running any OpenV switch at all on the server. Uh, so even if you, if, but isn't, it's when it misses, that's the problem. It goes where, to user space or? It goes, well. Right. Yes, it goes to user space on right. the ARM cores. Uh, on the ARM cores or the NIC. Yes. And what, uh, I don't know what the savings are because you're still gonna have a, still gonna go to user space, right? It's, it's just it's, a isn't cost, the like right, the, but it's there, there user space. Jamal, it's just this. a, what can you uh, run applications on answer, right? You can now run more apps on the Xeon, that's... Right, exactly. just, I understand the freeing part, but it, it seems there's a fundamental problem, Pro I, I don't want to sound biased, maybe uh, in the OVS architecture itself. Well, right? so that, that was right. the other question. This is an L3 forwarding thing. Why are you using OVS? The, the, if you use the routing path, you would not have this problem. You would download routes, so LPM would be loaded, you would, this whole problem goes away. So, you know, it, there's a much simpler answer. Look, look, it, is, it is a particular use case that we chose to study based on, there are a lot of customers that are using this. So, you could, you could characterize it using different data planes. We were looking at what you can do and, and how you can offload this work to a smart NIC and how that impacts the system. Yeah, yeah, so the one comment I would have is pick something other than L3 forwarding. This is almost the worst. I mean, the correct answer here is don't use OVS. 
uh, when I was, uh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> wait, wait, can you repeat that? For L3 yes. forwarding, oh, don't oh, use OBS. I, I it's the OBS. No, 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 button. sorry, I don't agree with that. It's when you configure OBS to do routing or to do something, OBS use megaflows. And then it's not doing it, not every packet is going to slow path. It's only the first packet, and that's all. This is the way uh, OBS is using megaflows. You're talking about, right. So, so this is abuse of, you know, you're trying to figure, to say that everything is going to the user space, but it's not the case. If they because are the forwarding in, that you specify was, I'm using flows. But you don't, uh, you're actually using flow because, as you mentioned, the flows packet is coming from a single port and going out on the second flow. This is the flow. On this flow, this is a one mega flow. In this one mega flow, you can run millions of connections, but it is still one rule. That's right. That's a different test case. The point is, in that, the ability to take advantage of mega flows depends entirely on your traffic pattern. If you have a traffic pattern that doesn't happen to hit the mega flow that you've added, then that doesn't solve anything for you. If it's not, if it's, if you've defined L3 rules and your your traffic doesn't match on uh, on your particular mega flow, but that doesn't help. But you, should, you should be able to. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I I agree to to a certain extent, but on on slide 12, you put that probability at 75%, right? Um, the, the probability of hitting, I guess. So 25% is missing. Um, so, I mean, you, you can tune your OVS for your traffic pattern, and you can minimize that. Absolutely, and, and as a matter of fact, we, uh, Andy sent an email because we wanted to talk to the OVS uh, maintainers about this. I mean, our goal is, is not to uh, malign OVS by no, any no, means. No, 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 so look, look it, I, I think it, it's... Um, <laughs> You can tune it, but isn't the issue here? Where are you running? I guess if you if you send, it could be a DOS attack, right? So this is this is always a problem with the route cache on Linux before it was removed. Got all these pawn sites attacking each other and <clears throat> making sure that everything is a miss. That could happen here. When there was a right. rather interesting uh, talk given at the Open vSwitch conference uh, late last year that talked about the actual extremely small number of packets that you need to send to... What, what, what would be interesting is if, you, if, if there's a study already that's been done everywhere that says, you know, on average you'll have 10% miss, but you can protect against DDoS attacks. And, and you can't, and which, a lot of that is data this, is, yeah. is, stuck, is, is stuck at the operators, um, not necessarily something that everyone can share or will share. But I um, think the, the important thing to understand is Control plane programming is very expensive, and what we tried to do here was characterize what that expense is for a particular use case. I, so, I, I think that's fair. Yep. Okay, so maybe to Shrajit's point, um, you know, friends don't let friends run OBS on application servers. So this is the part where you're supposed to laugh, in case you weren't curious, in case you didn't know. Okay. Right. I, I think I think that better. that conclusion is very valid, right? I think <laughs> the miss path handling is very important. My point, uh, to be precise, was don't you L3 forwarding probably was the worst example you could have used. But well, it, it is it is and it isn't. I mean, it's the minimum number. The L3 forwarding case, I'm pretty sure, in the OVS data path, uses the minimum number of instructions. And our point was not to explicitly call out. The, because it doesn't do cloning, it doesn't, it doesn't deal with um, having well, flows that are you know, currently unlearned and then rewriting. It'll so be we're... interesting to see if that, how that compares with the kernel's uh, L3 LPM lookup. I think the LPM lookup right now is going to be... Oh, uh, it's probably way better. Yeah, so yeah. I, th I think, that's what I said, L3 forwarding yeah. probably was the, was the wrong, or not wrong, was uh, an example that left itself open to criticism. But, oh, yeah, but, we expect no different. But, uh, but I think the meta point is absolutely valid, right? And I think it makes sense. And to the point we had uh, conversations over lunch, I think this, this is the stuff that needs to have a slightly more standardized answer. I think run OVS on ARM core is an interesting strategy. It's probably not practical because the people who are running OVS on the host now have to figure out how to get that OVS installed and jammed into the... Oh, we'll handle that. <laughs> Patches are on its way already. That's right. Um, Runs now. Uh. <laughs> 
but yeah, but I think the conclusion is correct. I think the overhead is real, and 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 it's now beginning to become significant portion of the compute as the rates are going up. Yeah, and I think one of the striking things to me was you know attending an OVS conference and and realizing what sort of what sort of data rates we talk about here and what people see and what people expect to see as high data rates, and it's a drastically different level of expectation. And I think it's, um, I mean, it's extremely functional. Uh, it works for a lot of use cases, obviously, otherwise people wouldn't use it. But it's, um, it's just a different, uh, there's a different cost associated with it than we, than we see. I mean, I think if Jesper were here, he would stand up and tell me exactly how many cycles it currently takes on his system at home to, to do XDP redirect. Um, uh, so, so yeah, we just want to sort of highlight that um, uh, that cost and look at some of the options that are available. I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. Any, any more questions? Oh, uh, it's all. So, okay, I guess you you guys don't work on OVS. Is anybody works on OVS here? No. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's not true that we don't. Right. We're not here to pick uh, on it, like yeah. we said. No, has anybody thought, okay, look, in the Linux kernel, it's a, considered a really bad idea to start caching at different layers, right? Because you're, set, you're opening yourself up to a DOS attack, right? If you have your own private LAN, that's great. It works well there, right? But route cache was, you know, a great experiment in that space. There are other subsystems in the kernel like ARP or IPsec, I think, with, uh, which will cache maybe about three packets and start dropping. After, after some threshold? Because, you, you know, I have seen, I, I've already requested for this slow path. I'm not gonna start uh, hammering user space again, right? So you have iKey listening on user space and it, res it is asked to resolve uh, a rule. Has that model ever been thought of there? So, um, so, so, yeah, in my opinion, I, I agree that it, it obvious wasn't designed for, for this particular case, right? Um, Yes, um, it does cache, it's op it, ha it has an open flow pipeline in user space, and if you're gonna miss in the cache in the kernel, you need to go via netlink from kernel to user space through that table, then get that cache. So that, it, yeah, obviously that, that's gonna suck, performance is gonna suck. Um, but my point, and I do understand that, and that is what, I've been at that same, same conference where that guy showed with, a very few packets, and this, this is a design flaw, I agree. Um, with very few packets, you can almost DOS the OBS. You, you can. Um, so, no, no, no critique there, um, <laughs> obviously. Um, I, yeah, and, and in my opinion, it's just not the, the use case we've seen. Um, but, yeah, I think it's, it, it's valid points. Um, you're, you're, you're basically, what you're doing is you're moving that, um, that expense down to your card. That's all, all, all you're doing. Right. So that's why, why you're that's getting right. zero. Because my, my other question was gonna be, how do you get zero, um, zero core usage without updating stats? And on, on day one of this conference, we had the whole stats conversation. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, 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 that at least takes part of a core to do stats update. But yeah, if you put that on, on the NIC, you, you don't need. Yeah, that, right. Right. The, so, other, the other yeah. part that um, was a little bit shocking to me, and I'll just share this with you because I thought it was a really interesting stat, is that at that same conference, somebody commented on the, the, the annual revenue associated with a core. And um, I've heard numbers go back and forth. I've actually heard numbers bigger than this and smaller than this. Um, but, but that was one of the things that floored me, is that um, if, you're, if you're leasing out um, uh, your system that on a per core basis you can maybe make as much as a thousand dollars US in revenue per year. So when you start to think about, and it, it, we were actually both there and sort of looked at each other and we're like, is that, is that legit? Uh, um, are those people hiring? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, I mean, if, if somebody is making that, that I don't see it. I, but. And, and it's, it's, I looked around a lot online and there's, there seems to be multiple people, not just this one person, that, that are that are claiming numbers in that in that area. So even if it's half that, or yeah. a quarter of that, um, it's a that's a, a massive amount. Um, and yeah, I wonder like, should I be? Maybe I should be hosting VMs. I, I don't I don't know. If you look at AWS rates, for example, it's a VM. You can get a VM for like three fifty, four hundred bucks for a year, right? So. 
if I mean, yes, it's not a core, right? Obviously, but and right. it's subdivided, but whatever. So if you can, yeah, and that, that's where you start to look at. It. You're like, well, are, could three of them run at the same time? Like, I don't know. So, oh, oh, uh, so yeah, if we had used uh, Linux kernel forwarding, what would uh, what would be the expectation of the CPU usage? Maybe CPU, maybe two cores, right? Two cores. How many packets per second? can we expect if we had used the Linux kernel forwarding instead of the OVS? Um, we didn't characterize that case. I would imagine that there are probably a number of people in this room that could probably give good numbers I, I on think, that. I think it would be a good, because uh, you're just doing layer three, right? It, yeah, it would have been, right. been a good test, in my opinion. You, I, I don't think we perform very well, in my opinion. <laughs> but. Well, no, no, they, no. they had a single route, I <laughs> think. Is it, is it a single route? One, one rule only? Well, no, 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 no it's oh. not. Uh, it's just they're all known flows. They're all known, right. right. Why would uh, we? We'll probably do okay, but. Well, then, I mean, that's, that's not the same. I mean, you can run it if you want, but we know that's gonna destroy it. I mean, just like we would know that um, DPDK would destroy the kernel data path of, of open, DPDK for the data path would destroy the kernel data path for open D switch. So, I mean, if you want to do apples to apples and have the most, the, uh, how would we say it, most flexible, most flexible one used. Um, it would be interesting to see the, the scenery offload versus the XDP versus OBS versus. Yeah, and, all, and I mean, we could, and actually we could run, yeah, we could run tests across the board. We can do all that stuff on the smart NIC, so, including XDP. I think you can mention more, the, can you show the slide again? Sure. I, well, I can't. So, somebody can. Oh, yeah. So I think the last, uh, the fourth, the higher one, the 90 million packets per second, this is the important one. Because you're trying to sell your course instead of Intel course. Okay, we'll say how much, you, how much cost your core, how much cost Intel core. We can debate. Okay? So, but I think the most important thing, it's the last thing that you are showing because then you get much better performance. This is something that you can't do with the uh, Intel cores, right? Right, without, without al allocating right. a significant number of cores. Yeah. Maybe more than are available in this 24 cores. Right, so this is the important thing, and this is the, the thing that we're doing today, of course, as you do it with the Connectix uh, cards, and indeed this is the performance around of 70, 90 meter performance per uh, packets per second. This is something that cannot be done today. All right. Um, sorry, we need a break. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys. I think. Yeah. Yeah.